Well, farm broadcasting is a part of American agriculture, and it's done by professionals who are furnishing the weather information, the market reports, the agricultural news, especially as it deals with government programs and things like that, that the farmer and the rancher need. Well, when I started out way back in 1946, it's uh, completely different. We, uh, I can remember listening to farm broadcasts that uh, had lost mules, <laughs> hound dogs that didn't come home last night, uh, things like that, but they also had conservation field days and uh, remake a farm in a day, things like that, to demonstrate terracing and, and building a pond and things like that. And it was a, an adventure. We didn't know, we didn't have anything to guide us in those early days. So what we did was try to talk to the farmers, see what they needed, and then give it to them. And uh, I can remember the first 4-0 corn picker, or corn uh, planter rather, that John Deere introduced. I was doing a broadcast from a John Deere day at the dealership. And I announced at 12.15 when I went on the air that we had something brand new, a 4-0 corn planter. Edwin Matlock, who lived at the other end of the county, got in his car and drove right into Kokomo and bought the planter before I went off the air at 12, 12.30. Uh, those are the kind of things that really enthuse me about farm broadcasting. I've mentioned a book from Purdue one day on the air, just at the end of the program, I said, oh, I meant to mention Christmas houseplants. This is Christmas Day at 1.15 in the afternoon. I said, I have a, a, a bulletin from Purdue on caring for your Christmas houseplants. If you'd like a copy, send me a postcard. I had 560 postcards for that bulletin. Uh, so I knew I had an audience. Of course, that was a WLS, which was 50,000 watts and covered about four states. Uh, but those are the things that you run into that convince you that uh, farm broadcasting can do the job. Well, just by the things that they have said that I've helped them do. Uh, gee, I, I go back to make a speech to a, an audience of farm management people that I helped start the association 25 years before. And people in the audience will tell me what I said to them one time that helped them a lot. Uh, I can remember one 4-H boy that I interviewed who said, uh, I asked him what kind of a hogs he was showing. Well, I expected him to say Poland Chinas. But he said, oh, just pig hogs. And many years later, he explained to me that he didn't understand the question. He knew he had a Poland China. <laughs> he thought I was not really there. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, of course, Larry Haig was the first president. Herb Plambeck acted as the secretary to get pull these farm broadcasters around the country who were all doing different things and, and together. Now, it all started at Columbus, Ohio, about 1943, when uh, a group of farm broadcasters were at this uh, American Institute for Education by Radio, they called it, at Ohio State. The program really didn't fit. It was mostly educators. It didn't really fit what the people doing farm broadcast wanted to know. So uh, they decided they ought to form their own association. Well, World War II interrupted, and it really wasn't officially formed until 45. And it was first called NARFD, because everybody had rural mailboxes, and the RFD was the, the address, RFD 1 or 2. and. Uh, National Association of Radio Farm Directors fit with the RFD. That was suggested by Art Page, who was an old pioneer at WLS in Chicago. Uh, it was kind of interesting at the uh, first meeting when they voted to organize the, the motion to form an association was made by the oldest member and a motion to second that was made by the youngest member, who was Sam Snyder at KVOO in Tulsa. Uh, there were a lot of interesting stories about those early days uh, and how the organization has changed. It was strictly an organization of guys who didn't have any support like we have now. It's very professional now, but in those days, we were 
begging people to sponsor a luncheon. Uh, wouldn't you like to buy lunch for about 50 farm broadcasters and things like that? And the Sears Foundation said, yeah, they would. The National Safety Council said, yes, they would. The uh, Fertilizer Institute in Washington, D.C. agreed to sponsor the annual banquet. And that's the only way we could do it because uh, our membership fee was $5. Uh, <laughs> we did raise it to 6 and that caused us a great deal of concern, especially a couple of members. <laughs> that was just getting to be too rich for their blood. <laughs> but you see, we were meeting in the, uh, in the Stevens Hotel in Chicago, which became the Conrad Hilton. I can remember negotiating a fee on rooms of about $12 a night, I think it was. <laughs> they weren't very fancy rooms, but... Yes, and 4-H Congress and the International Livestock Show. Okay. And they all were right there at the same time. So we started Thanksgiving night and met Friday and Saturday. The 4-H Congress started on Sunday, and the International Livestock Show was underway from Friday, I believe it was. And so we all had reasons to be there actually all week. Uh, the next week, we were covering the International and the 4-H Congress. But in 1971, we moved to Kansas City <laughs> because of the FFA convention. And about that time, the Club Congress was something else. They moved out of Chicago. And uh, we were in the Muehlbach Hotel in 71 and 72. And as soon as they got the Westin built, we moved here. We were their first convention they ever had here. <laughs>